Welcome back to another episode of I Used to Be a Psychic podcast. Today, I have the absolute pleasure of interviewing Holly Pivik, who co-authored this book, Counterfeit Kingdom. It's all about the NAR movement. And for those of you who aren't familiar, NAR stands for New Apostolic Reformation. You might be a little bit more familiar with Bethel Church in Redding, California. They are a leader of this movement, and many people don't realize what they're actually incorporating and teaching within their church. A lot of their teachings, practices, and beliefs are deeply rooted in the new age occult. And it's something that is very close to home for me and a topic that I feel very strongly about as I was saved out of the new age. I don't want to see it in the church. And I think a lot of people are deceived by this movement. It sounds great. And they aren't realizing the deception that can creep in. So I'm very excited to have Holly here to discuss this. She is an expert on this. So I'm going to let her do the majority of the talking. Um, But this is a great conversation. And I think it's really, really important, no matter what stage you are at of your Christian walk, maybe you're not a Christian yet, and you are slowly coming out of the new age right now. This is really important because you don't want to fall prey to a church like Bethel that is incorporating new age teachings and trying to pass them off as traditional Christianity. So let's dive right into the episode with Holly. Hi, Holly. Welcome. It's so nice to have you here on the podcast. Thanks, Mia. I've really been looking forward to meeting you and and doing this interview with you. Thank you. Well, I really appreciate it. And I am a huge, huge fan of this book, Counterfeit Kingdom, that you co-authored. And it's just such an honor to have you here and be able to shine some light on this. So um, for those of you who don't know Holly, Holly Pivik is a blogger, author, and speaker, as well as a pastor's wife and homeschooling mom. I love that. She has a master's degree in apologetics from Biola University, where she has also served as a university editor for nearly a decade. She has co-authored three books about the new apostolic reformation, which is what we're going to be discussing today. One of them is Counterfeit Kingdom, which I have right here, which is the dangers of new revelation, new prophets, new age practices in the church, as well as a new apostolic reformation and God's super apostles. She operates a popular blog, which has followers from around the world and has spoken and written for several audiences and outlets. So you are well informed on this topic, and we're going to be discussing the dangers of NAR and how it kind of correlates specifically to the new age and you know, Bethel Church, because I know Bethel has such a big influence. So Mm -hmm. Um, can you tell us a little bit just about your, your background? I mean, I know we have your introduction and, you Mm -hmm. know, what you've, what you've done, but how did you really get intrigued with NAR? Like what sparked your interest into researching the NAR movement? Yeah. So while I was, you had mentioned when you were introducing me that I worked at Biola University as the university editor, and I was the managing editor editor of Biola Magazine. And um, in that capacity, I would receive emails from readers of the magazine. A lot of these were people who had graduated from Biola. And um, one day I received a letter from a reader, a woman who had graduated from Biola, and she was describing this movement that she said was overtaking churches in her city. And she was very concerned about this movement And she was hoping that by sending a a letter to the magazine that I could forward it maybe to some professors on campus and and maybe she could find a professor who would be interested in in writing a book responding to this movement and showing why the teachings are unbiblical and why they're dangerous. And it caught my attention as I read this email because I was a researcher of cults and and off-key groups. Um, And so I was surprised I had never heard of this movement. It had mentioned apostles and prophets and... And so I got online and started, you know, Googling and I couldn't believe even at that time, like 20 years ago, how large and influential this movement was. And I didn't know it was all around me, but I didn't know because I didn't know the terminology. I didn't know the lingo. And, and I started recognizing that and started seeing signs of it all around me. And in fact, I share in the book about that same time, I started dating uh, Adam, who's now my husband. And I realized at that time that I was learning about this movement, actually, that he was attending a church that was a part of this movement. And um, so the lights went on and I was like, oh, I think he's part of this new apostolic reformation. And so that was a big part of our relationship. It caused some tension. 
Um, (laughs) when, you know, when I confronted him on that and, and, um, I'd share that in the book and eventually his eyes were open, you know, praise God. He, he left that movement. Now he's a pastor and he warns people about it. But, um, so, so that's initially, it was initially kind of an academic interest, but then it turned into, it got very personal very quickly. Um, and you know, I, I've had extended family who are part of this movement as well. And, and I share a little, little bit about that in the book too. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, I I mean, you kind of have a personal, I guess, interest in it, you know, because you went, you knew someone so close to you that, that Mm -hmm. was saved from it. Right. Right. And still have uh, extended family who are part of it and, and have seen, um, and have seen even with one extended family member who, who, you know, passed away of cancer, really believing the promises of the apostles and prophets in this movement that she would be healed of cancer even to her dying day and holding on to the teachings of Bill Johnson and other leaders in this movement. So, so wow. yeah, I've seen firsthand the the pain that this can cause. That's devastating. So I know a lot of people who are listening to this may, you know, not even know what NAR is. And I mean, I've done quite a bit of research. I read your book, of course. And um, would you mind just elaborating a little bit on what NAR stands for, it's, you know, and what, what it means, um, you know, because a lot of people probably haven't heard that term. Sure. So the New Apostolic Reformation, or NAR for short, <laughs> it's a global movement. It's, it's a fast growing movement um, throughout the world, um, really in the global South, Africa, Asia, Latin America, it's just explosive growth. But but even here in the United States um, and, and everywhere, um, we receive letters literally from people around the world talking about the ways this movement, the teachings have come into their churches and, and split their churches or brought division to their families and, and marriages and um, just all the destruction from it. But um, the, core, the, the, the leaders of this movement teach that they're authoritative apostles and prophets. So much like the, the Old Testament prophets, Christ apostles, and they teach that um, all people in the church, including pastors and elders, must submit to them. They must hold the highest offices in the church. These apostles and prophets must govern the church, and the reason they must govern is so that they can bring critical new revelation that they would say that all Christians need to have so that every Christian can learn to become a miracle worker, so every Christian can learn to prophesy, every Christian can learn to heal the sick, can raise the dead, can even learn to work greater miracles than Jesus did, if you can imagine that. And, um, and they would say, not only can all Christians be doing that, we all, we should be doing that, or really we're not fulfilling God's will. And, and the reason is so that, that all Christians can kind of rise up as this in time miracle working army that will bring heaven to earth, or that will bring God's kingdom to earth and usher in Christ's return. So that's kind of an overview of the movement. And one thing I like to point out is a, a lot of people, maybe most people who are involved in this movement have never heard the term new apostolic reformation. So you won't, you can't ask someone, you can't ask a church, oh, are you part of the new apostolic reformation? They may have never heard that term. It's a term that's uh, maybe used more by researchers or choosed by some leaders in this movement, but even many leaders in this movement will deny they're part of the movement now because, um, it's a con- it's controversial and they don't mm-hmm. want to be associated with it because it's caused a lot of controversy. And so it's really important to realize that you got to look out for these core teachings about apostles and prophets governing the church, bringing new revelation. These are the things to look out for because um, people might not use that term or know that term new apostolic reformation. Perfect. Thank you so much for clarifying that. Cause that's probably one of the biggest questions I get. I post quite a bit in my story about NAR and, you know, sharing just different people's uh, takes mm-hmm. and, and just breakdowns, you know, Mike Winger just did a really good mm-hmm. um, YouTube video and I was sharing that and I've shared your podcast with others before and talked about your book. And the big question is like, what is NAR? What is NAR? And even recently I, I just had a conversation with a sister and she was concerned that her church might be NAR because of the lingo. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think that there's a a bit of a difference because people, these, they're not just saying that they have prophecies for the Lord, you know, they're not just saying, and and I'm kind of one of those people where I'm fairly new Christian. Um, You know, I've only been saved for about 10 and a half months. My verdict is still out on whether I believe in, you know, whether I'm like a continuationist or a cessationist, Mm -hmm. like I'm kind of like, I have my own very profound experience 
with the Lord when I got saved, but it didn't lead me into some sort of new revelation. It led me straight to the Bible. So Mm -hmm. I'm kind of on the fence with that. But the big thing is that the Bible tells us, you know, if there are prophets, they have to be 100% accurate on everything. And the Bible tells us that, you know, even in the Old Testament, they were going to be killed if they weren't, you know. And it's my understanding that NAR leaders have actually had quite a few failed prophecies. So that doesn't seem to be in line with what scripture says about prophecy needing to come to pass. So I'm curious what your thoughts are on that. Yeah. And I'm glad, first of all, you made the distinction. Um, Doug, my co-author, Doug Guyvett, he's, he's a bio, well, he's a professor emeritus now, uh, retired at Biola University of Philosophy and Theology. And he and I always really make it clear in our books and in our interviews that we are not critiquing Pentecostal or charismatic teachings about the miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit. We're, we're not arguing that there can't be prophecy today or speaking in tongues or, or these kind of things. And of course, God can and does do miracles today. We're not arguing against that. Um, <laughs> what we are arguing against is the idea that there are these governing offices of apostle and prophet that everyone must submit to. And even Pentecostals and charismatics, many are very concerned about these teachings. So they're not, you know, they're not Pentecostal charismatic teachings, they go way beyond that. But as far as, um, yeah, so many, many prophets in this movement um, will, well, what they teach is, is that uh, they can give prophecies that turn out not to be false, that, that don't get fulfilled. They can make predictions that don't come to pass and still be considered a genuine prophet of God. And I can't wrap my head around that. <laughs> yeah, they'll say, well, that Old Testament, you referenced Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 18 talks, you know, about that a prophecy has has to happen if they make a prediction um, or else you know that they're not a genuine prophet. But they would say that test is an Old Testament test that no longer applies today in this era, this New Testament era of grace. And, um, and so during the election, 2020 election, Dozens of prophets in this movement prophesied that Donald Trump would be reelected to a second term and and that he would win the 2020 election. We all know that didn't happen. (laughs) Yeah, right. Chris Valentin. So I talk about Bethel Church a lot and we talk about Bethel Church in our book because they are the most probably popular, well-known church in this movement today, Bethel Church in Reading. And their prophet, Chris Valentin, even prophesied this. Afterwards, he admitted he had gotten it wrong, but he said, that doesn't make me, you know, that doesn't mean I'm a false prophet. Um, but, but the thing is that, you know, they want to be regarded as pro they set themselves up like they're old Testament type prophets, but at the same time, they don't want to be held to the same le- standard the same of standards, accountability. Yeah. yeah. So that's a problem. So there are many charismatics today who would say that they believe there's a gift of prophecy and that you can have the gift and still make mistakes. Um, uh, I, I think that's a view that's mistaken. I think that that continuationists can and should believe that there's a gift of prophecy today and, and that it isn't fallible. It doesn't, there aren't mistakes, but that being said, even so what leaders in this movement are saying is still very different. What they're saying is they can be in office with all this great authority, giving prophecies to nations and about nations like old Testament prophets did and, and these kind of things and still miss it. And that that's um, definitely something that can't be supported with scripture. Agreed. Agreed. Well, I mean, you mentioned Bethel and I think that was one of the biggest red flags for me is I, I was listening to their music when my husband and I first got saved, we got saved together. I'm not sure if you knew that, but it was, it was really cool. And so he got really into music. That was kind of the first thing that he kind of ventured into. And I remember one day he was just listening to a song and I was like, what are you listening to? That's not biblical. Like you need to turn it off. And for some reason it just, I guess the Holy Spirit just nudged me. And I was like, something's off about that. And so he was like, what are you talking about? Like, it's a Christian song. So I started doing some more research on it. And, you know, I think most people that know the name Bethel, they know the name Bethel from, from their music. Like that's what they're famous for. They're famous for their excellent songs and, you know, they're very catchy. They're very well written. Um, But, you know, a lot of people think that even if they are familiar with NAR teachings, they think that it might be okay to listen to these Bethel songs. And I'm just wondering if you could share with your listeners, you know, a little bit about your perspective on that. And, you know, because I feel like their their music is just as dangerous as their teachings. But I would love to know if you think they're kind of influencing people in any way through their music. 
They definitely are. And, and, and they're very open about that. We have a whole chapter in our book about music and we call, we call that chapter toxic worship music because we believe that the NAR music is toxic. And the, and the reason we say this is because, um, you know, first of all, music is, is so powerful. We all know that, you know, we can go to church and we can sing a worship song and we'll still be thinking about that song and maybe singing it all week, maybe even after we've forgotten the sermon. You know, so music is very powerful in forming our beliefs. Um, it really is, is, you know, we call it the catechism of today's church, but it really, it really form, forms our beliefs. And, and NAR music, what many people don't know is they do take NAR teachings. Bethel music takes their teachings, distinctive teachings, and puts them into the music. But many people don't recognize that because they don't know the teachings and they don't know the buzzwords. Mm -hmm. And so the the lyrics can sound just fine to a Christian who's not familiar with NAR and not realizing that they're using words, but they've given them different meanings. And we give examples in our book of, of lyrics like that. Um, but, but Bethel um, leaders themselves have been very open that they see Bethel music as a tool for planting Bethel teachings and practices in churches throughout the world. And um, Bill Johnson even, um, he's even, he, he said, Bill Johnson said this, he's the apostle of Bethel Church. Music bypasses all of the intellectual barriers. And when the anointing of God is on a song, people will begin to believe things they wouldn't believe through teaching. So, so Bill Johnson knows and that, that, you know, people wouldn't necessarily they wouldn't accept their teachings if they just if they were just said but when they're put to music then that causes people to accept things that that they wouldn't usually believe and he thinks that's a capacity of music that should be exploited that sounds um, dangerous to me though is, like that sounds yeah. like it, you're really just opening yourself up putting yourself in that vulnerable state like that just when you read that statement it's just like red flag red flag you know yeah, exactly. And so, and we've talked to many people who've shared with us that their interest, that they were first drawn into NAR or they were first drawn into Bethel Church because of the music. They listened to the music. They really liked it. They did. Then they said, oh, who makes this music? And next thing you know, they're signing up for a conference at Bethel or reading the books. And and so so we refer to the music as a gateway drug into NAR. And, um, and, and so, um, there's many reasons, um, I think it's wise for churches to avoid using this music because they're exposing their people to the teachings. They're priming them to be more receptive to the teachings. Um, the, the money that the churches have to pay to use the music is going to fuel and fund this movement for a number of reasons. We think That's it's a wise huge reason right there not to support. Them. Yeah. For churches to avoid using it. Well, I mean, you went to Bethel. I, so I just want to jump into this. You you went there to the Bethel Supernatural School of Ministry. And I would just love to know. I mean, I read about it in your book, of course. I just want to say to listeners, um, if you haven't read this book that Holly and Doug wrote, Counterfeit Kingdom, please get your hands on a copy or even just get the audiobook. I started with the audiobook and then I needed to have a hard copy. I've already gifted it to a friend um, and sent it to her. This book goes over everything that we're talking about in just like so much more detail. But for me, when I started reading everything you were saying about the, the BSSM, I was blown away because I come from the new age. And so for me, I was like, just my jaw was on the floor. I couldn't believe that these practices were being taught, you know, in, in churches and your book just confirmed everything that I had kind of been thinking on my own feeling like maybe I'm crazy. Maybe I'm just, you know, slightly jaded from my new age past that I can't be open to this stuff. I've actually had a lot of people say that to me. Oh, well, you're just, you know, everything there's a counterfeit for it, but what we're doing is real. And, you know, that, that just doesn't sit right with me because these seem like they're true new age practices. So I just want to know what you experienced when you're there. If you could just tell us a little bit about that so that, you know, everybody who's listening can kind of hear what you witnessed. Yeah. And yeah, so we call yeah, we call that chapter Hogwarts for Christians because students at Bethel School of Supernatural Ministry actually re fondly refer to their school that way um, as, you know, the school in Harry Potter. Uh, but um, so I actually went to the adult Sunday school class. It's called Fire Starters. I went to it's a 12 week class. I went to one of the classes where they were teaching people to they were activating people into a gift of the prophetic and, and teaching people to prophesy who had never prophesied before. And so fire starters is kind of like, 
it's it's almost kind of like a it's like a mini or a crash course into Bethel School of Supernatural Ministry for people who can't actually attend the full school. The school's a three-year program, mm-hmm. but they have this adult Sunday school class. It's a 12-week course um, for people who can't attend the school. And so that's what I attended. And um, that day they were teaching people to prophesy. And what they were doing was, I mean, there were all kinds of things going on in the classroom that day. There was drunkenness in the Holy Spirit, you know, where people were passed out as if they were drunk under the influence of the Holy Spirit for the whole class and, and things like that, that I describe in the book. But, um, but what they did was they asked people who had never prophesied before, if there were any volunteers. And I think they took four volunteers to come to the front of the classroom and they would have a volunteer come up one at a time. And they would tell them to just pick someone in the audience and say in the classroom and say, whatever came into their head as a prophetic word for the person in the room and they they were told not to filter it do whatever you do don't filter it just say whatever pops into your head as a prophetic word and um you know i don't remember all the exact details but but once it's in the book but one student came to the front and you know they said something like uh, they they gave a date and they said does that date mean anything to anyone in the room and you know sounds like a psychic kind of where, like blanket yeah reading. right <laughs> and it's kind of like oh that's well that's my birthday or you know that kind of thing and it's like you know and then, oh and a, and a name is coming to mind does anybody have this name it's like well that's not exactly my name but that's my birthday and I'm like okay we'll go with that you know and then they gave a message to the person and and so what we talk about in that chapter is is what Bethel and what NAR churches teach is that It's like everybody has a latent prophetic gift that just needs to be activated by taking part in these prophetic activation exercises. So that I want to just interject for a second, if I can, Um, because the, the verbiage alone, just like activation, I taught psychic development. I wasn't just a practicing psychic. I actually, and I'm, this is the worst thing I feel the worst about, but I actually taught people to develop their psychic abilities. So to channel spirit, so to speak. And the way that you're describing this is exactly the same kind of lingo that I would use. I would say, you know, everybody has the ability to channel spirit. Everybody has the ability to talk to your spirit guides and angels and even God, you know, what we called it source energy in the new age. And you had to have, you know, their spiritual activations and all sorts of of different things that they would have to come and do to be able to learn and develop these gifts. They would have to come and take level one. I teach them, you know, A, B, C, and D, and then they come back and I teach them more and slowly develop these abilities. But it's okay if you don't get it right. You're probably just having an off day or, you know, there's always an excuse for why, but it sounds so much like Bethel's practices are exactly like what I taught in the new age, which mm-hmm. I, when I was saved was shown, you know, the veil was kind of ripped off for me. And I was shown that I was actually speaking to demons and I was channeling demonic entities for this information. It wasn't coming from the Lord. It was coming from the enemy. And so my concern with Bethel teaching these is that they're a church, but they're practicing that you can just receive anything and channel well it's basically channeling to me from the lens I'm looking at it through you know from this ex new age lens so I'm yeah, just like wondering how they justify this you know <laughs> yeah and the, you know we we point out in the chapter that that leaders they teach that that these do look a lot like new age practices what we're teaching and the reason is is because the new agers allegedly stole these practices from Christians and we need to redeem and reclaim these practices for the church so that God's kingdom can be, you know, go forward on earth. Um, and so they're very open about these similarities. And they'll even do things we talk about in the chapter. Uh, students in Bethel School of Supernatural Ministry will go to psychic fairs and set up tents where they give pro- spirit readings and, mm-hmm. and, and things like that, kind of posing as psychics. And, and, you know, they'll say that they're giving prophetic words. And that they're doing this as kind of a creative tool of evangelism, but there's a real question of, are they actually really sharing the gospel at all? Because, because they will even avoid mentioning the name of Jesus or God or the Holy spirit or anything that might be offensive to the new age crowd, you know? So, um, yeah, so there's, and so there are a number of practices like this, even, um, things like necromancy, communicating with the dead, um, and I mean, know, this, the Bible talks about this being divination. It's very clear, yes. right? So yes. yeah, I just, it's hard to wrap my head around. Why is anybody doing something that's clearly condemned in the Bible? Yeah, the occultic practices, divination are, are strongly 
condemned in scripture. Old and New and, Testament. Yeah, it, right. And and it can be, uh, you know, the source could be people's imaginations. The source can be demonic. You mm-hmm. know, that that's a real possibility. And so it's um, it's really, really dangerous. Uh, these practices are, are extremely dangerous. And the possibility of, of opening people up even to demonic influence. Yeah, I think that the, it's, it's the possibilities there, you know, and it just depends on, on that individual. But for me, like through the lens that I've seen and and what I was involved in and how I got pulled out of it, like my perspective is that they were 100% opening themselves up to demonic influence, just because a you're going against the word of God. And, and, you know, there's that scripture in second Timothy um, four verse three and four, it says for a time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but have itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions, turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. And it sounds just like what's happening. You know, when I was in the new age, that's what I was doing. I wasn't listening to sound teaching. I referenced the Bible all the time. I didn't read it, but I referenced it, you know, and it's funny how I just followed the new age because it, it felt good. It felt fluffy. It felt, it's all about experience and, and it, it's all about feelings based. And it seems like, you know, Bethel is, is kind of the same. Yeah. And the experiential is huge at, at Bethel and, and, you know, another prophetic or another activation exercise that they'll do is they'll have two students who don't, you know, they'll blindfold two people back to back. So they don't know who's behind them. And they'll say, say, you know, uh, try to guess the favorite movie of the person behind you or their birth date or, or just say whatever pops into your head as a prophetic word for that person. And so that's another, another type of prophetic activation exercise that, that they promote. Very similar to psychics and, and new age, right? Yeah. Um, And we show in our book too, that a lot of what they do looks like they're teaching cold reading mm -hmm. practices too where it, you know, cold reading is just when you can look at a person and you can figure out a lot just by looking at the person. Do they have a wedding ring on? You know, well, they're probably married, you know, or they have a certain age. Uh, you can, you can guess things that are reasonable about people. And then, and then of course there's hot reading and hot reading is, is when it looks like what you have is prophets in the movement who are engaging in research beforehand oh, wow. about people who will be attending a, an event, for example, finding out information online about them, And then standing up on stage and acting as if God is giving them that information in the moment uh, when actually they did research ahead of time. And so we talk about that, too, how how it seems like that that also is is going on in this. Yeah, I remember I remember reading that. Honestly, this book is just fascinating and just answered so many questions that I had about this. But, um, you know, when because there is a really big difference between you mentioned briefly earlier, just like a charismatic church who believe in the gifts of the spirit. And you're not saying any, you're not kind of, there's no putting down of a charismatic church. It just so happens that Bethel is also a charismatic church. They are just taking it to a whole new extreme and charismatics, you know, even Pentecostal churches, any form of, of charismatic church should be concerned about Bethel um, in a big way. And it's, it's a lot of times I've noticed personally um, from, you know, chatting with people and trying to talk about NAR is that there's this sense of like defensiveness that comes up and that's never the intention. And, you know, I think that these denominations should also be just as concerned about NAR. Could you just um, speak a little bit about that as well? Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, so the Assemblies of God is the largest Pentecostal denomination in the world. Okay. And they've actually, they've actually issued papers against NAR teachings. Um, they didn't call it NAR. It wasn't known as NAR. So just for people who don't, who might not know, there was a movement called the Latter Rain Movement in the post-World War II era, like the late 1940s, early 1950s. And really, uh, the this movement was promoting the things NAR is, that apo- they're apostles and prophets, they should govern the church, they're bringing new revelation, all of this stuff. And it was quickly condemned. The teachings were condemned by the assemblies of God. They said, no, we, you know, we condemn these teachings. And so it fizzled out and it kind of went underground. And until prophets started resurfacing in churches in like the 1980s and then apostles in the 1990s. And um, and so now um, what you have is so in the assemblies of God, you know, they have these position papers that are against the new apostolic reformation teachings. 
But then you also have many assemblies of God churches where the teachings are really coming in. And it's, it depends on the pastor because the churches are very allowed to, you know, they run very independently. Mm -hmm. It's really up to the pastor, what they allow, he allows in or she allows in. And so, um, so that's, that's how NAR teachings are really coming into like Pentecostal churches, like the assemblies of God. Um, and they're also coming into Nazarene churches. I mean, I'm talking to people all the time from different denominations that are just really concerned about the inroads NAR is making into their denominations. And they're really trying to figure out what can we do to get our denomination to take a stronger stand, you know, to issue more statements, to really take a stand against these teachings because they're really concerned at, at how they're coming in. Yeah. Well, I think it's really important that they do so because, you know, with, like I said, with the lens that I have from the new age, like it's, this is dangerous. This isn't just a difference of interpretation of scripture. This is a dangerous perversion of scripture and also just adding to, to scripture really. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, there, so there are different types of error. There's heresy, mm -hmm. which is, it's like, if you believe, if a, you believe in heresy, that means you believe something that me makes you not a Christian. So like a cult of Christianity, like Mormons or Jehovah's witnesses or something like that. They, they don't believe that Jesus is God. Well, that's heresy. I was raised a Jehovah's witness. Right. So. Okay. You know, yeah. so you can't be a Christian and, 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 and believe heresy. That will mean you're not a Christian because it contradicts core Christian belief. Right. And, th but some people think that all there is, is there's heresy. And then there's kind of issues that don't really matter that much. They're just secondary differences matters over maybe church worship music style or in time yeah. views or things like that, that aren't as important. And what people don't realize is there's this another category of error uh, called aberrant teachings. Okay. And these are not, they don't rise to the level of heresy necessarily, but it's still serious error. And, it, and people who embrace those teachings are, are really endangering themselves and their faith. And they're very harmful teachings. And so what we would say, what Doug and I would say is NAR teachings are aberrant teachings. Okay. So maybe not rising to the level of heresy, but still, nonetheless, they're very dangerous teachings. It's, and these aren't just matters that are just like, oh, you know, Christians can agree to disagree. They're, they're very serious error. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Thank you for clarifying that. So from my understanding, um, you know, NAR also has a very different method for how they go about prayer. So they, you know, and I read this in your book as well, but it's more of a commanding or declaring something, not kind of coming humbly petitionary prayer before God asking if it's his will. Um, so why is that of concern? Yeah. Well said the way you described it. Yeah. So, so biblically, historically Christians view prayer is, is making petitions of God, asking God, if it's your will, you know, will you please heal this person or will you please do this or that? Um, but in NAR, that's a less effective, weaker form of prayer. It's really a prayer of people who don't have much faith. The, the, the prayer of faith, the powerful, effective prayers are declaration prayers. And that's when you declare that God will heal this person or God will release these finances or, or you know, do this or that. And so they teach that Christians, as children of God, we have the authority through our spoken word to create reality, much the way God spoke and created. Or, or they'll say that... Um, when we speak, angels carry out our prayer declarations and, and make them into reality. And um, and so like when Bethel Church was trying to raise little Alla from the dead, she was a two little mm -hmm. two year old little daughter of a worship pastor uh, at the church who passed away in December 2019. They spent six days making declarations, trying to raise Alla from the dead. And, and they asked people, their followers worldwide to join in and make these declarations. And it became like this global campaign where they were, you know, at, at the church, they were singing and chanting, like, wake up all of, and, you know, making these declarations. And then after they didn't work, uh, you know, after six days, sadly, uh, all of was not raised. And so Bethel issued a press release and to the media who was covering this. And they said that um, they really reframed what they had been doing. They said, well, it's normal as Christians for us to ask God to, you know, to do something like to raise all of from the dead, but really they were mischaracterizing what they had been doing. They'd very clearly been saying they were making declarations. And then after the fact, when the declarations didn't work and they realized how it looked, they said, Oh, we were just asking God to raise all of, and that's normal. That's a normal Christian thing to do. And so it's very important for people to realize how leaders in this movement equivocate on language. 
they have shifting terminology and definitions and they'll use one word when they're talking to to biblical christians or outsiders uh like they'll say prayer but they mean prayer like asking god and then they'll but when they're talking to insiders or people within the movement when they're talking about prayer they're usually talking about prayer declaration so it's very important important for people to be aware of this tactic and the shifting language because a lot of people are being drawn into NAR without realizing it because of this this equivocation of language. It makes sense. Um, like I'm, I'm sure you're familiar, but in the new age, the big thing is manifesting. And I actually taught manifesting, you know, mm-hmm. you can speak whatever you want into reality. Your words have power. You can say whatever you want and, and you'll receive it. And, you know, I, I did manifest a lot of stuff, but what the Lord showed me is it wasn't him that was providing these, these things that were kind of coming into my path. It's because I was, you know, so intertwined with the new age and with Satan that, you know, he was trying to keep me on that path and was kind of putting things in my, in my, uh, I guess in my path that I wanted. And so it really concerns me when I hear Christians talking like this and saying that they have the power to create with their words. Um, cause it's exactly what I did. And, you know, I did a lot of research on this topic because it is so close to home for me. And what I found when I got into scripture, which is my reference for everything, not my own feelings or my own ideas about things, you know, it's the Bible. And I'll, all I found is that God speaks things into existence, not us. And so it kind of sounds, and the more kind of, I went on that path of research, I learned a little bit more about the prosperity gospel and about the word of faith movement and the, the beliefs and the practices sound like quite similar. Um, is NAR kind of slightly influenced by them or are they influenced by NAR or do you have, like, could you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, good question. So what NAR leaders teach is that God has been, um, restoring, truths to the church that have been lost through the centuries so like starting with the protestant reformation with the doctrine of salvation by faith you know martin luther since then god has been progressively restoring these truths that have been lost to the church through apostles and prophets and so they would say that some of the truths that have been restored to the church are prosperity gospel teachings word of faith teachings about declarations, things like that. Um, prosperity gospel teachings that God wants all Christians to be wealthy and healthy. And they believe that these are essential truths that the church must have in order to bring God's kingdom to earth. So for example, how can you bring God's kingdom to earth? How can the church bring God's kingdom to earth? If we don't have a lot of money, the church needs a lot of money to establish God's kingdom on earth. Well, that's where prosperity gospel teachings come in. To play, And so they, there's this revelation in NAR that there will be this great in time transfer of wealth from the wicked to the righteous. So this wealth will be coming to all these apostles and prophets and their followers so they can use the wealth to build God's kingdom on earth. And so that's really how like prosperity gospel teachings come in and and get intertwined. So so in short, prosperity gospel teachings, word of faith teachings are very central to NAR theology. It's funny that you say that because um, the scripture just came to mind. Um, I just opened on it, of course. Thank you, Lord. Um, uh, Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth <laughs> where mm-hmm. moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and seal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and seal or where your treasure is there your heart will also be. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're taught really clearly in the Bible that we should never be chasing, um, you know, earthly wealth. We should be chasing the treasures of heaven. So it's interesting that they, uh, you know, that they believe this because I'm wondering what, you know, what are some common scriptures that they might misinterpret that would lead them to believe this? Cause it doesn't seem to line up with what's in the Bible. Right. Well, they see, they see passages in the old Testament that, that, applied to the millennium, the millennial age, you know, when Christ will establish his kingdom on earth Mm -hmm. and they take those and they apply them to, to really the present age. And so, because remember in NAR, the goal is to bring God's kingdom to earth before Christ returns uh, to whatever, you know, they might disagree. NAR leaders will disagree about how much of God's kingdom can be brought to earth prior to Christ's return. Maybe just much of it, maybe all of it. Um, but that's the goal is to bring God's physical kingdom to earth. 
And so, um, and so, yeah, they, they say money is a big, big part of that, but that verse you cited is, is very, or that passage is very appropriate, uh, in this context. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's interesting because when I was in the new age, I was just all about money and now I'm all about God. And I'm like, obviously we need money to live, but like, that's not the main driving force of life anymore. And so it's interesting to see the different interpretations on that and how some people can just think that just because we're Christian, we're going to be super rich and we're going to ha- be so wealthy and happy and be healthy. But lots of very Bible, like, Bible reading, God loving, fear, God fearing Christians die from diseases and, and, you know, illnesses all the time. And a lot of them live without a lot, but they love the Lord. And Jesus went to all the people who were, you know, poor or lost or, you know, that really needed him. And I feel like that the, he never promised that they were going to be wealthy or be healthy. He just promised them eternal life. And that's kind of like the really big difference that I've noticed is like, I am thankful that I'm going to have eternal life. I don't, it's not about what I receive here on earth. Yeah. And it's so often through our trials and our struggles, our sicknesses, our, our, all of our struggles. That's how God sanctifies us through these things, you know, grows us in holiness. We become more like Christ. And so if we can just snap our fingers and get rid of all of all of these troubles as much as we would like to, you know, and be just healthy and per- perfectly healthy and rich, you know, then these these things that that God uses in our lives to sanctify us, we wouldn't have, you know. So and true. so it's interesting to me how and NAR, they they, you know, they act as if we shouldn't have any trials or troubles, you know, that, that and those are the very things God uses to 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 sanctify us. So interesting. Again, it's just everything you say references back to the new age. Cause that's what I taught. If you, if you're experiencing negative things, it's because you're attracting them into your life. And that we, if we, you know, follow these new age teachings that we'll just have everything that we could ever want in life. And that our whole purpose of being here is to have whatever we want and live this life of, you know, desires being fulfilled. And that just, is completely contrary to what I have learned, um, you know, on my walk as a Christian. So I have, um, I have another kind of interesting area to bring up for a lot of people. They might not be familiar with it and it's the passionately wrong Bible as you call it in your book. Um, and I, when I heard the story about Brian Simmons and how he decided to create this sounded just like the new age and how, you know, um, he even mentioned, I'm not sure if you're familiar with this, but he even mentioned that he was promised by this angel that he was going to be given the 22nd book of John. And he went to this library in the sky and this is his interview him explaining it. And that's exactly the new age. Like we went to this place called the Akashic records where there was like this energetic library where we could access, you know, hidden knowledge. And it's kind of the same lingo that NAR uses. We're just accessing hidden knowledge that's been lost. And so I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit about the passion translation, because I am passionately against this translation. um, But a lot of people might think it's okay to use it. Yeah, yeah. And actually, I wrote a blog post uh, some years ago about um, about him claiming that this 22nd chapter had been revealed to him. So I am familiar with that. But um, yeah, so the Passion Translation of the Bible was produced by the Brian Simmons, who's an our apostle. And he claims that in 2009, Jesus Christ visited him personally, commissioned him to produce this, to make this new translation of the Bible. He claims that God told him he would give him like, um, uh, like uh, divine downloads that would en- enable him to translate and secrets of the Hebrew language. Um, and that there's an angel named Passion who accompanies him in his ministry and helps him with his work. And so um, there, there are uh, some disturbing similarities, for example, to, you know, the way Joseph Smith would, would have claimed to receive, you know, uh, his, his scripture, but uh, with, with Mormonism. Mm-hmm. But, um, but um, so the, the disturbing, the concerning thing about this Passion translation, though, is it's wildly popular because it's been promoted 
by a lot of very influential apostles in this movement, like Bill Johnson and other influ very influential leaders. Bill Johnson has even preached from it from the pulpit. There's a special uh, edition of the Passion Translation that's like a Bethel Church edition. Wow. With, um, and so, um, it, and Brian Simmons will say that you can use this as your primary Bible for study. It's not just a paraphrase. He says it's a reliable translation. But a number of scholars, um, um, a number of them were commissioned by Mike Winger, did reviews of the Passion Translation. And these are reputable Bible scholars who work on like the Bible translation committees. Um, and, and they reviewed this translation and they found that it's, uh, it's very unreliable. It's not a reliable translation at all. It's, um, it reflects bias, theological bias, uh, which is to say that he takes our teachings and puts them into the text. So he makes it sound like the Bible is supporting our teaching and practices by just adding things to the text. And, and we give a lot of examples of that in our book. Um, but he also claims that he was translating from like original Aramaic manuscripts that don't even exist. Um, Bible scholars will say these manuscripts don't even exist. We don't even know what he's talking about. And so it's, it's a very problematic translation for a number of reasons. Yeah. I mean, that's a question I get a lot. Um, I get a lot of new age to Jesus followers. That's my, I think one of the biggest, they find me through my podcast and, mm -hmm. you know, they, they're looking for support and I get what's the best Bible translation a lot. And I always kind of lead them to the ESV. That's my personal favorite. Mm -hmm. Um, and I do use the NLT, which is what you would call a paraphrase, but I don't use it as my main Bible. I kind of use it to help explain scriptures to people who might be new and struggling. Um, but like you said, this isn't just a paraphrase. This isn't this. They're adding stuff. And in Revelation, it's very clear not to add anything to the Bible. And yeah, it's definitely not even a reliable paraphrase. No. It's it's um, it's someone who's taken a bunch of stuff that he wants the Bible to say and put it into the text and made it say sound it, like it supports things it doesn't yeah wow well I mean you probably deal with you have dealt with this quite a bit in your career and since you started talking about NAR um is a common accusation that when you bring up NAR teachings to people that you're creating division mm -hmm. um I would love I've gotten that myself um you know you're just being judgmental or you're just creating division um but that's never the heart behind it and I was wondering if you could speak to your own experience about that a little bit yeah, yeah, we're often accused of creating division. And, and the thing that people need to realize is that the people creating division in the church are not the people that are pointing out these harmful teachings that are damaging people and their lives and destroying their faith. The people causing division are the ones who are introducing these teachings. I mean, these are teachings that have not been taught through the history of the church um, you know, have not been and and they're the ones that are introducing these these novel unbiblical teachings and then when other people point them out and say they're harmful they go oh you're causing division and it's like no we're not causing division you're the one creating division and there's actually a verse we we quote in our book it's romans 16 17 the apostle paul says i appeal to you brothers to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught avoid them so so it's the nar leaders who are who are causing the division by introducing these new teachings and what others are doing is, is just pointing out that these teachings are harming people. And they really are. We, we share stories in our book of, I mean, kids, young college age kids going off to Bethel school of supernatural ministry and then never communicating with their parents or extended family again, oh. just cutting off all contact with them. Um, churches that are just splitting air left and right because these teachings come in and the division that's caused, you know, because there's no middle ground when, when you bring apostles and prophets into a church and, and you say, you got to submit to us and receive our revelations. People are, have to decide, you know, are they going to or not? Well, this splits churches, you know, and, um, uh, marriages where one spouse will be into these teachings and the other one won't. And, and, and then what do you do with the kids and how are they going to be taught and all, you know, so, um, we, we get letters really just about daily from people share talk, sharing these sad stories of how they've been harmed by this movement. So, so, um, when people tell us that we shouldn't be speaking because we're causing division, you know, what we keep in mind is all of these people who are contacting us 
who've been hurt and are asking for help and they're in recovery, trying to recover from these teachings. These are the people we're, we're writing for, you know, and, and that, that's why we're speaking up for them. And I think that's really important. They need a voice. They need to be heard. Um, because yeah, it's from what I've seen, it has, it has caused a lot of division. Like I said, I've done a lot of research on this. Um, you know, for someone who might want to bring this up with their pastors, who, you know, might not necessarily be a NAR church, but maybe incorporating some of NAR's beliefs or practices. Do you have an, any advice for, for them? Yeah. And so, so first of all, I make a distinction. Yeah. So there are some churches that are just NAR churches. They're either part of apostolic networks or, or their pastors have just embraced all this stuff and gone full into it, you know? So that's going to be different. That's a different situation where now if you have a church that's not in our church, but you just maybe you're um, seeing maybe, you know, the women's ministry is using a book written by a leader in this movement or or there's um, a small group study and people are studying a book by a leader. You know, they, these are ways it can come in um, the music. Maybe your church is starting to use a lot of Bethel music. Um, the, you know, I think it's very important to have conversations with leadership very respectfully. Um, there are a lot of movements out there, other movements besides NAR, and it's hard for pastors to keep up with everything. You know, they're busy, um, but just help educate pastors and, and elders and leaders of a church about this movement. Maybe ask if they've heard of the new apostolic reformation, would they be willing to read a book or listen to a podcast or something to learn more about it? Um you know, bring up your concerns respectfully. Um, maybe if you can get more people in the church to, to bring up their concerns too, the more, the better, if there are others, mm -hmm. um, and, and just start that way with respectful conversations and trying to, you know, educate leadership and see how it goes from there. Now, based on the response you get, um, you know, it might tell you something if, if your pastor's open to, to learning more or hearing what you have to say, but if, if they immediately get defensive and, um, you know, maybe really start defending uh, like Bethel Church or leaders in this movement, things like that, it might it might give you a clue that maybe your leadership is is a little has bought into this stuff a little bit more than you may realize. OK, thank you so much. I really appreciate, you know, because I know I've got, gotten questions about that in the last couple of weeks since I started really sharing more about this. And I know that's going to be helpful to them. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, you talked about the families that have been kind of torn apart by this. And um, you talk in your book about how, you know, children are getting caught up in this movement, you know, specifically through it's exciting. I mean, it's exciting to have all these superpowers, basically, especially for someone maybe coming out of high school or, you know, the younger students. What kind of how can the parents, uh, you know, guard against this or help mm -hmm. teach their children to be aware of this? Yeah, it's, um, it's very important for parents to really monitor their children's intake. And so like, don't just send your kids to a church and to their Sunday school class or to the youth group and assume that they're being taught soundly. Um, even at sound churches, we've heard stories from parents who sent their kids to youth group. It was not in our church, you know, and then to find out later that the youth pastor was into NAR and was leading the kids into NAR. Um, right. and, um, and, and the leadership didn't necessarily know that. And so, um, or, or a lot of times what you'll have is like maybe a, a youth group where they're taking kids to conferences or music concerts and things like that. And that's where they're being in, introduced to NAR. And so just really parents should really monitor their children's intake, find out what curriculum is being used in Sunday school classes. Uh, if their kids are going to camp, who's teaching, who are the partnering organizations that are partnering, uh, you know, with camps? Um, what will the kids be taught? Just really be on top of that. Also, they should really prepare their kids to know what NAR is and to be on guard for it themselves. Um, because, you know, we as Christian parents will often, you know, we'll warn our kids about atheism or, or maybe new age or, you know, things like that. But often parents will not think to warn their children about NAR. It's it never even crossed their mind. And we share a story in our book about a dad who said, you know, he thought he was pretty knowledgeable biblically and, and everything, but he was caught totally off guard when his college age daughter went away uh, on her own and started attending these NAR influenced churches. And he had no clue. And he just thought they kind of had a charismatic bent and he was happy. She was going to church, 
late, only later to find out she just, she went off the deep end. She, uh, she started talking about apostles and prophets and these visions she was having and just cut off her family and, and took off to Bethel church. And, um, and, um, he, he said he was blindsided, you know, it's like, people don't, don't think about NAR. They don't think like, I need to warn my kids about NAR. And so, so teaching kids what to be on the lookout for, as far as the teachings and, and also just teaching kids to how to interpret the Bible soundly for themselves, um, and, and teaching them sound theology and, and all of this so that, that they have a good foundation too, so that they can spot things that are off is very important. Thank you. That's really helpful. I think sometimes the like almost truths are like more dangerous than the things that are like atheism and new ageism and all these things. Like when it's so close and they're talking about, you know, Jesus and the Bible, but then adding all this other stuff, it's almost more dangerous. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that, you know, maybe people that are going to be listening to this podcast might be realizing that they are in an our influence church. Um, and you know, it's, it's our prayer for them that they, they can, you know, come to this understanding that this isn't biblically sound. And, you know, it seems like there's a bit of a road to recovery when you come out of an our church, similar to kind of getting saved from the new age or any other, like maybe Mormonism or Jehovah's witness or any other kind of, uh, false belief system. Is there anything that you would like to share maybe with someone who's in that position that's just having the realization while watching, you know, this, uh, this interview, like, oh my goodness, I think I'm in an our church. What could you kind of speak to them? Yeah. Well, and, and, you know, we, a lot of people have contacted us and told us that like, oh, I know. I realized that I've been part of NAR and didn't even know it, or maybe, maybe their entire Christian life, they've been part of NAR, you know, because now NAR has been around so long that you've had young people grow up in NAR and that's all they've ever known. Um, and, and it can be scary for people. And, you know, it's, it's, um, uh, so, I guess what I want to encourage people to do is like, don't panic. <laughs> um, you know, there is recovery. A lot of people have gone through recovery and there are, there are recovery groups on Facebook. Like there's a group called not, I think it's NAR recovery group, non-denominational. We mention it in this book. Um, but there are people there to walk alongside you, but it's really important, um, to get out of your NAR church, to get in a good sound Bible teaching church, and, and we explain in our book, we give tips for how you can look for that, but um, get in a sound church. You know, a lot of people will say, oh, I don't want to go back into church because I was deceived and I'm afraid of being deceived again, but that's dangerous too. You need to be in a sound church. You, you need to find others who can, who, who can walk alongside this with you. And you need to learn how to read scripture correctly because you've probably learned how to read it incorrectly because the apostles and prophets you followed have modeled for you poor ways of reading scripture, using it out of context. Uh, they claim to see hidden meanings in scripture that no one else can see. Well, you got to unlearn all this stuff and you got to learn how to read the Bible accurately and in context. Um, and so that's very important too. Um, and uh, yeah, and you know, we offer a number of tips in our book, but those are some of the big ones. Find a good church, find fellow Christians who can relate to you and can walk through you with this. And then learn to read scripture, you know, correctly. Um, and and I just want to encourage people that that many people have done that and they have walked through this and they've gone to the other side, but it can be really scary and and overwhelming at first. Well, thank you so much for encouraging them because I know it's it's really overwhelming coming out of anything like that. And I've walked through it. I know many other people have, but just hearing your perspective, you're kind of an expert on this. So I think that's gonna be really encouraging to anybody listening. Um, well, Holly, this has been absolutely wonderful. Um, I feel like we could talk about this for so much longer. Um, where can people go? You've mentioned your blog a little bit. I think that your blog would be an excellent resource just for my listeners. Where can people go to read that blog? Yeah. So it's hollypivic.com. Okay. So H O L L Y P I V E C. And, and I am I'm also on Facebook and Instagram and I'm very active there as well. If people Perfect. want to find me there. Okay. That's super helpful. Well, everybody, please be on the lookout for Holly's new book, uh, her and Doug Guyvet. Is it Doug Guyvet? Is that correct? Guyvet. That's right. Guyvet. Okay. <laughs> I wanted to say Guyvet when I first saw his name, <laughs> but I, I just wanted to practice that. Um, for her and uh, Doug Guyvet's new book that's coming out, do you have a release date yet for that? 
Oh, you're talking about our next book, right? The next book I that's coming out. Yes. Right. Yeah. So Counterfeit Kingdom is our book that just came out in November. We do have another book in the next few months sometime, I believe. We don't have a release date for that yet. Well, everybody be on the lookout. <laughs> that'll be a, a more um, academic book. It will be, so. this this book here I really recommend for people. It's kind of a lay person's introduction to, to the teachings of NAR and Bethel Church. And then the other book will be for people that want more. They want to go deeper. Um, and, and that's called the title is reckless Christianity is the main wow. title, but, um, that, that should be in a few months. That Sounds will great. Out. Yeah. I'm really excited for it because I, I went through your book like right away. Um, I'm going to link the, uh, Holly's blog below for everybody who's listening and I will link, uh, the Amazon link to purchase. Is there a better way to purchase your book or is Amazon the best way for people to get a hold of it? I think Amazon's good. It's also, okay. um, anywhere else books are sold. It, okay. it can be ordered. Okay. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much again for your time and just for speaking about this. And I'm just really looking forward to hopefully having you back on again at some point. I would love that. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Have a great day, Holly. You too. Bye. Bye, Mia. <laughs>